Hello and welcome to World News Program. I'm your host, Melissa Nurkhimilat, and these are the headlines. Algerian President Abdelmajid Tebboune receives the President of the European Council, Charles Michel. Algerian Foreign Minister Antal Amamra receives the Special Envoy of the Secretary General of the United Nations for Western Sahara, Stefan Dimistura. Two people were killed and 11 injured after a suicide bomber detonated explosives near the interests of the Russian embassy in Kabul. Several EU nations announced emergency plans to combat skyrocketing energy prices as news of the Nord Stream pipeline shutdown hit the markets, causing a 33% energy charge asleep. Algerian President Abdelmajid Tabun received this morning at the Algerian presidential residence the President of the European Council, Charles Michel, where the two sides held bilateral talks. The President of the Republic, Abdelmajid Tabun, had this Sunday a telephone conversation with his Italian counterpart, Sergio Mattarella. According to a statement from the presidency, during this call, the two presidents were able to exchange visions regarding bilateral relations between Algeria and Italy in valuing the strength of these high and distinguished relations between the two friendly countries in many files. Algerian Foreign Minister Amtal Amamar received the special envoy of the Secretary General of the United Nations for Western Sahara, Stefan Di Mistura, who is on a visit to Algeria. Amamar discussed the latest political developments related to the Sahrawi issue and prospects of strengthening international efforts to resume direct negotiations between the two parties in the conflict, the Kingdom of Morocco and the Polisario Front, with the aim of reaching a just and lasting political solution. The Minister of Foreign Affairs and the National Community Abroad, Ramdan Lamamara, received on Sunday in Algiers the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of Malaysia, Dato Kamaruddin Jafar, who was on a working visit to Algeria, according to a statement of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. On this occasion, the two officials reviewed the bilateral relations and prospects for giving a new incentive to the historical relations between the two countries. Malaysia and Algeria shares a lot of common positions on all the international and the domestic and the bilateral issues that we are together facing today. So uh, what I've heard from Excellency Foreign Minister uh, are issues and views that we find very, very common and very comfortable to work together with. Algeria affirmed that the Arab summit to be organized in November will be held on time. Algerian Foreign Minister Ramdan Lamamra reiterated Algeria's full readiness, or readiness to host the Arab summit next November, while the website of the Arab League announced the official logo of the summit. Sara Farjani has more. Attempts to confuse and delay rumors, the Arab summit will be held in Algeria at the beginning of next November. The Mediterranean country has confirmed its full readiness to host the summit, expected to reunify the Arab countries and to receive all participating delegations. The website of the League of Arab States posted the official logo of the Arab summit in its 31st regular session. 
The website specified that Algeria is hosting the summit under the chairmanship of President Abdelmajid Tebboune. Foreign Affairs Minister Ramadan Lamamra had also assured that Algeria is ready to host the summit scheduled for November 1st. Lamamra's statement comes after some media websites published news about the possibility of postponing the upcoming summit. Algeria is ready to host the 31st Arab League summit next November, despite all those obstructionist voices that have made some noises on the weekend on some Arab uh, news outlets. Uh, knowing that Algeria has the, 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 the capacity to organize such events and Algeria also is trying to position itself as a stabilizing force and the unity force to bring the Arabs together in a very difficult geopolitical context that is shaping the region, uh, geopolitics and local politics. The convening of this summit implies that there is an Arab consensus on Algeria's pivotal role in many conflicts. Algeria hosting the Arab summit will be a ground for the reunion of Arab states, whether from the African continent or the Asian one. The 1st of November is a historic day for Algeria. It marks the launch of the first bullet of the Liberation Revolution. And through this summit, it will mark the launch of an expected Arab unification. Algerian Foreign Affairs Minister Ramtal Amamra had on Sunday a phone conversation with his Syrian counterpart Faisal Miqdad, who confirmed that his country prefers not to raise the issue of resuming its seat in the League of Arab States during the Arab summit that will be hosted by Algeria in early November, according to a statement issued by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The UN envoy for Western Sahara, Stefan Dimistura, met on Sunday with the leader of the Polisario Front, Brahim Ghali, in Tindouf in Algiers as part of his second regional tour. The meeting took place in a Sahrawi refugee camp during a closed door discussion between Mr. Dimistura and the leader of the independence movement in the presence of the Polisario representative to the UN, Omar Sidi Mohammed. A series of stabbings in two communities in the Canadian province of Saskatchewan in left or left. I say 10 people dead and 15 wounded. The stabbings took place in multiple locations on the James Smith Cree Nation in the village of Weldon, northeast of Saskatoon. More in this report by Usama Ayadi. Canadian police hunted for suspects in a stabbing spree that killed 10 people and wounded at least 15 others mostly in a sparsely populated indigenous community. The stabbings across 13 crime scenes were among the deadliest mass killings in modern Canadian history and certain to reverberate throughout the country, which is unaccustomed to bouts of mass violence. Today, September 4th, at 5.40 this morning, the Saskatchewan Divisional Operations Communication Centre, or the RCMP DOCC, received a call reporting a stabbing on the James Smith Cree Nation. In the following minutes, our DOCC received multiple calls reporting additional stabbings at different locations in the community. The first stabbings were reported in the early hours of Sunday, and within three hours, police issued a province-wide dangerous persons alert, as by the afternoon, similar alerts were also issued in Saskatchewan's neighboring provinces, Alberta and Manitoba. Police named the two suspects as Damien Sanderson and Miles Sanderson, providing photos and descriptions, but no further details about their motive or the victims. A statement by indigenous leaders indicated that the attacks may have been drug-related. The two men were seen traveling in a black Nissan Rogue and spotted in the city of Regina, about 320 kilometers south of the attacks in the James Smith Cree Nation and the village of Weldon. As the investigation confirmed the two suspects, Damien Sanderson and Miles Sanderson were traveling in a vehicle. At 9.45 a.m., a fourth dangerous persons alert was sent to the entire province, indicating multiple victims in multiple locations were located, including one victim outside the James Smith Cree Nation, one in the community of Weldon, Saskatchewan, and that some victims were believed to have been attacked randomly. 
Authorities explain that some of the victims may have been targeted, while others appear to have been random. On a tweet, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau called the mass stabbing as horrific and heartbreaking, and he showed his support for the families of the victims. Meeting amid the economic uncertainty, OPEC Plus will discuss several options for stabilizing oil prices, including cutting production by 100,000 barrels per day. OPEC Plus, which brings together members of the Organization of the Petroleum Exportion Countries and its allies, estimated in a report published last week that the world oil market would record a larger surplus than expected this year due to rising energy prices and tighter monetary policies. Several EU nations announced emergency plans to combat skyrocketing energy prices as news of the Nord Stream pipeline shutdown hit the markets causing a 33% energy charge sleep. Hossein Burkan compiled this report for us. Indefinite closure of Nord Stream 1 gas pipeline announced last Friday due to gas leakage issues, according to Russian oil and gas firm Gazprom. A hit in gas markets resulted immediately in a price leap to over 30 percent, which sparked fear among EU nations that Russia will shut down supplies during the winter. Countries across Europe are considering taking measures to face the soaring prices. Germany, the spine of the EU economy and the most affected by the Nord Stream pipeline shutdown, has approved a new aid package of 65 billion euros so that citizens and companies can face the increase in the price of energy and inflation. The tripartite government coalition led by Olaf Scholz affirmed that they will be able to face the winter without restrictions, even if the Kremlin permanently closes the gas tap. The third relief package we put together is bigger than the first two combined. It is of a large dimension. We're talking about 65 billion euros when you add everything together, and we're talking about 95 billion if you include the first two relief packages. That's a lot we're doing. It's necessary. France, in turn, called for a response to the gas cuts by curbing Russian energy revenues and demanded that there must be consensus among all European countries. I think that the key point is to pass through this uh, winter without too many difficulties for European economies and European citizens. That's the key point. Uh, we have the G7 being united in the idea of capping the oil price with the view of reducing the oil revenues for Russia. Then there is the question of implementation, which will be quite difficult. You know that you need the unity of all the 27 member states. Despite the measures taken by the EU nations, Europe's economic outlook has darkened once again, as rising gas prices could worsen the inflation situation. Growth expectations in the EU economies will have to be tempered according to gas flows through Nord Stream controlled by Moscow and possibly Norwegian gas pipeline, since the potential gas out is threatening Europe's biggest economies. The euro has fallen to a two-decade low after Russian energy giant Gazprom extended the closure of its gas pipeline to Germany. Fears over soaring energy prices and potential shortages pushed the euro further below parity or parity against the U.S. dollar, sending the single currency as low as 0.98 against the U.S. dollar for the first time in two decades. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky claimed battle fight successes during his forces' counteroffensive against Russian troops in the occupied south region of Kherson. Zelensky thanked soldiers for talking or taking two settlements in the south along with additional territory in the east, citing good reports from his military commanders and intelligence chief. I spoke today with the President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen. It was, as usual, a very meaningful, very beneficial conversation about all aspects of our relations. I thanked her for the support already provided. I also thank for the efforts to limit excessive Russian profits from oil and gas. I called to speed up the provision of financial assistance to us, Ukraine. We discussed new sanction steps. In particular, I believe that the eighth sanctions package must include pan-European visa decisions in relations to Russian citizens, such as decisions that none of those involved in this war can enjoy European hospitality. 
Liz Truss won the ruling Conservative Party's leadership contest on Monday and will become Britain's new Prime Minister after replacing the custard or the ousted, sorry, Boris Johnson. The Foreign Secretary beat her rival Richie Sonak, former Chancellor, in a bout of Conservative Party members by 81,326 voters to 60,399 after a bruising seven-week contest to succeed Boris Johnson. The turnout among the 172,436, or 37, I say, eligible voters were 82.6%. I will deliver a bold plan to cut taxes and grow our economy. I will deliver on the energy crisis, dealing with people's energy bills, but also dealing with the long-term issues we have on energy supply. I know that we will deliver, we will deliver, and we will deliver. And we, and we, We will deliver a great victory for the Conservative Party in 2024. Thank you. For further discussions, uh, we are joined live from Germany by Mr. Gunther Wolzenberg, Professor of Political Sciences at the University of the West England. Professor, thank you for being with us. It's my great pleasure. Thank you. Professor, as we have just seen, Liz Truss has been chosen to become the new Conservative Party leader and the UK's 56th Prime Minister. What's next for her now? What are the challenges she will be facing and what does she need to do to solve these challenges? Well, her promise is that she can address a whole list of problems uh, by, for example, um, reducing the tax burden on ordinary citizens in the United Kingdom. Uh, the biggest challenge she has is, of course, the cost of living crisis uh, due to the conflict in Ukraine and rising energy prices, which uh, create a huge burden on the general public. But this, this is, of course, not the only challenge. There are quite a few more. For example, the trouble in the National Health Service a lack of around 50,000 nurses, around 10,000 uh, doctors. Um, there are further problems with regards to the uh, challenge uh, from the ongoing aggression of Russia in Ukraine. Um, there are a number of questions with regards to the Brexit agreement with the European Union. And there are also further challenges, uh, what to do with the unity of the United Kingdom uh, as regards demands by Scotland to have another referendum about their potential um, uh, uh, change of constitutional arrangements mm -hmm. with the United Kingdom as a whole. So it's quite a long list and tax cuts just on their own won't do. So there has to be quite a few more measures to address these challenges and to unite the party behind such a unified programme. Liz mm -hmm. succeeds Boris Johnson. She has been loyal to him as she has ex explicitly announced. Do you think, Professor, that she will continue on Johnson's path in dealing with the internal and the external issues uh, in the United Kingdom? Uh, that is a very interesting and difficult question because on the one hand, she is certainly the continuity candidate. So mm -hmm. in contrast to uh, uh, Rishi Sunak, she certainly emphasized uh, the strong bonds and even in her speech that she gave, she emphasized and expressed a, a long thank you to Boris Johnson. On the other hand, if you take her uh, political performance over the years, you will see uh, that she is someone uh, who does make U-turns and, and who does change her views and opinions its circumstances change significantly. So this is a bit of an open guess. Uh, if we follow what she says, she is certainly the continuity candidate. If we follow what she has done in the past, there has to be the expectation that we will see more U-turns on the promises that she has made so far. Thank you, Mr. Gunther Walsenbach, for being with us. Thank you very much. Moving on to another topic, two people were killed and 11 injured after a suicide bomber detonated 
explosives near the entrance of the Russian embassy in Kabul. Afghan police added also that the attacker was shot dead by armed guards as he approached the gate. Staff at Iraq's parliament returned to work Sunday for the first time since powerful Shia cleric Muqtada Sadr supporters stormed the legislature in late July. The development come or came as Speaker Mohammed Al Halbusi suggested an agenda for an upcoming national dialogue session following an 11 month political paralysis that sparked deadly clashes in Baghdad last week. Thousands took part in celebrations across Shili overwhelming, overwhelmingly, I said, on Sunday after the majority of Shilians voted to reject a new progressive constitution to replace the current text drafted in 1980 by the military dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet. More with Marwa Belehiwar. In Chile's capital of Santiago, horns blared in celebration as groups of people gathered at numerous intersections to celebrate the results after the polls closed. Chileans agreed by an overwhelming margin that a proposed progressive constitution to replace its current dictatorship era charter was not what the country needed. In a referendum, almost 62% voted against the progressive draft. Chilean president, who had lobbied hard for the new document, had previously said a new constitutional process must be initiated to comply with the 2020 referendum. Men and women of Chile have demanded a new opportunity to encounter each other, and we must live up to this call. That is why I'm committed to do my best to build together with Congress and civil society a new constituent itinerary that will provide us with a text that, gathering the lessons learned from this process, will be able to represent a board majority. The vote marked the climax of a process that began when the country, once seen as a paragon of stability in the region, exploded in student-led street protests in 2019. We struggled so much with the social outburst when everybody was demanding changes, the politicians, the government, what we had in health care, education, and we lost. The unrest was sparked by a hike in public transportation prices, but it quickly expanded into broader demands for greater equality and more social protections. The new constitution would have had a greater focus on social rights, the environment and gender equality than the existing charter. It would have established autonomous indigenous territories and recognized a parallel justice system in those areas. It doesn't feel like a victory in itself, but rather it feels like a step forward for the country in which we do want reforms, we do want improvement, but not in the way we were doing it. We don't want more polarization. We want to be happy. We want a united country and not with the violence that we have been experiencing during the last two or three years. In contrast, the current constitution is a market-friendly document that favors the private sector over the state in aspects like education, pensions and health care. Kenya's Supreme Court on Monday upheld results declaring William Ruto winner of last month's presidential elections. The deputy president of Kenya, William Ruto, was on August 15 declared the country's president-elect after winning the presidential election on August 15th with 50.4% of the votes cast. The victory of Ruto was, however, rejected by his main opponent, Raila Odinga. And it is very important, even as we begin the journey as a nation, that we agree that Kenya is going to be a country based on the rule of law. And tomorrow, equally, we will respect the decision of the judiciary because we are a country based on the rule of law and respect for all the institutions. That is the only way we will remain democratic. That's the only way we will remain a constitutional country. And that is the only way the citizens of the Republic of Kenya will be equal. And we finish with NASA, which called off the second attempt to launch a test flight of its new moon rocket Saturday due to a stubborn leak that delayed 
Uh, fuel, away, fuel in, I say. The space agency hoped to launch its Artemis 1 moon mission at around 2 p.m. Saturday, but a hydrogen fuel leak thwarted the second attempt in less than a week. The uncrewed Artemis 1 lunar mission will not lift off until late this month, according to the agency. Well, that's it for today's World News. For more news stories, don't forget to follow us on our social media platforms on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Thank you for watching, and bye.